virgin most powerful radio sharing the gospel with clarity and charity I'm a soldier for Christ I'm a soldier for Christ I'm a soldier No they never take us under because we bring a truth like thunder Raining on your speakers like a ton of bricks Hold the cross high cause we're Catholics Fight the good fight with the truth Stand tall with the truth I'm a warrior for Christ I'm in love with the truth Love God, save souls, slay error Go stronger Welcome to the Terry and Jesse Show Yes, it's Friday Matt Arnold is sitting in the seat where Jesse's usually at Actually, uh here yeah. and uh, actually not really but yeah I'm, I'm joining you the way jesse normally does yes i'm actually that's, here that, that's more that. accurately yeah. saying hey i did we have a special show today we're going to be doing the gospel as we always do we're going to be doing the fulton sheen quote but we're going to be talking about the holy eucharist for half the show but we're also going to talk about some of the challenges we're up against in regards to you know either uh you know christ or, or nothing in other words we're going to show how we need to turn our lives over to Jesus Christ to have the truth that he's given to us and not turn it to ourselves. And because this is what we see happening in our world right now is that we want to be our own God. So that's what we're going to be doing. But today we're going to get some soul food. And we had celebrated St. Jerome's feast just last week. And he's the one who said ignorance of scripture <coughs> is ignorance of Christ. Mm-hmm. So we have the gospel of Luke. Is that correct? Yeah. Luke chapter 10 there verses. 13 through 16. So a reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Uh, Jesus said to them, Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty deeds done in your midst had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would long ago have repented, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And as for you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will go down to the netherworld. Whoever listens to you listens to me, and whoever rejects you rejects me, and whoever rejects me rejects him who sent me. Thus far the words of the Holy Gospel. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Matt, I'd like to hear your commentary, but I'd like to try and bring it down to the basic level of saying uh, we need to do it God's way, everything in our life. And when we don't do it God's way, it seems that history repeats itself. Every time we reject God, uh, we have a problem on our hands, and then God comes and brings justice, and then we turn and repent and turn back to God. But I, you know, I just it just seems like it's a uh, it, like history repeats itself. Right, I mean, it's, a, it's a long succession of false gospels. Yes. Uh, you know, from Protestantism to the Enlightenment to, mm-hmm. to socialism to. You know the uh, to the LGBTQ etc cetera, etc cetera, movement yeah. of today. Yeah, it's uh, and, and what did Saint Paul say? You know, even if we are an angel from heaven should come with a different gospel, you reject them. Exactly. And what did Jesus? Uh, you know, the, the very famous part uh, of this passage, of course, you know, Jesus is saying, "Look, I, I've been doing miracles. You know, if, if if these miracles had been done, you know, in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago. Mm-hmm. You know, what, what's what's your excuse? Why are you not responding to this?" And he says to the to the apostles, "He who hears you hears me." Yep. And and so that's you know the church has always understood that is you know it's the voice of the church is the voice of Christ that we are to to listen to the church, and you know we we come into that very uh, very troubling gray area. I'm Dietrich von Hildebrand talked about this in the yep. devastated vineyard back in uh, what 1973 74 right. early 70s. He wrote that book and said that you know when when. Uh, that that a a bishop right a prelate can't expect people to obey his ordinances if he himself yields to pluralism. Well said. And, and I'm saying what, what, that's really what you're talking about is every time we make a concession to the world, obviously that's going to uh, to damage our relationship with Christ and with heaven. Well said, Matthew. And again, we're going to be I mean we're going to be talking about that before I bring Bishop Sheen into the picture. I br- I left my piece of paper. Um, in my upstairs office, but it was such great news. The Supreme Court on today has agreed to take a case in Louisiana regarding the Roe versus Wade that could affect Roe versus Wade on abortion. Right. You know, it's interesting, too. Yeah, because... um, Great news. Yeah, well, first off, because we have a couple of different justices now that may uh, interpret the law a little more in accordance with, oh, you know, the law. And (laughs) you also have... That's always good. Yeah. 
And it, it's interesting also that it's that it's being heard because the the, the people opposing it oh. argued um, about a judgment that they made in a case in Texas that was a, rather similar. Yes, that's right. And they're saying, well, you shouldn't even hear this, but it's proceeding, and that's also the Yeah, difference. they agreed to hear it, and I think I mentioned yesterday a quarter of a million signatures were put on a Supreme Court a, a front yard there showing mm-hmm. people who want to re, uh, re, want to overturn Roe versus Wade. So right. I just want to encourage It is good listeners. news. It is good. I mean, the cynic in me uh, yeah. would suggest that, it's, uh, <laughs> it is good that, news. that both sides are going are to uh, oh, yeah. benefit from this because they're going to make it a campaign issue because this is, you know, the, the court isn't going to hear this case until, you know, uh, the 2020 rolls around. So keep the pressure on with your prayers and also your visits to the clinics through 40 Days for Life. Amen. Let's bring Bishop Sheen into the room. <laughs> that was perfect timing. <laughs> the train has arrived. Fulton Sheen is here. What do you have to say today? The good Bishop Sheen says, looks, and this is real simple, and it ties right into our show. He says about the will, he says, most people want to be good, but they do not will to be good. At, Matthew, that just hit me because I think of generally everybody you talk to says, yeah, 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 I want to be good. Oh, does that mean I have to deny myself? Oh, does that mean I have to control my appetites? Right. Do I have to pick up my cross every day and follow Jesus? Is that what that means? Yes. <laughs> St. Thomas Aquinas took that quote, and I think he took it from St. Thomas. because Yeah, know, which is a pretty good, uh, yeah, pretty you're good gonna, source. You're going to plagiarize somebody. <laughs> uh, St. Thomas Aquinas said, you want to be a saint, will it. That's right. So it takes effort. I'm not saying this workout <clears throat> that we're asking you to do in the spiritual gym here of the Terry and Jesse show is easy. I didn't say no, that. No, no, nobody ever promised that. It was simple, actually. Yeah. It's pretty simple, oh, yeah. but, but it's not easy. You know, I mean, no. uh, a lot of things are simple, but not easy. So that's our Bishop Sheen quote. Do you have anything else on that? Or if not, I'm going to move on. Proceed. Okay. <laughs> I love it. You know, Matt, I'm sure glad you were willing to join me on Fridays because I wouldn't want to just be with my guardian angel doing this show. <laughs> All well, right. I, you know, I mean, your guardian angel is good company, but, uh, but uh, he doesn't have much to say on the mic. So. Absolutely. And this is going to tie in again to the readings of today. We talked about from Luke about the world and the devil and the flesh. I want to show you how crazy the world is right now. In Britain, a British court declares biblical understanding of sex incompatible with the human dignity. So here's here's how it happened. A British court ruled against a doctor working for the government who was fired for refusing to use transgender pronouns, declaring in the process that a Christian understanding of sex is inherently unjust. Tell me about that, Matt. Wait. Right. So, yeah. So, what, but what the British court is saying is that if you, if you, you know, uh, exercise your uh, yeah. If you, well, well, if you exercise your right to recognize reality, <laughs> there you uh, go. I love that. That's and, a- and that's ultimately that's what we're talking about here. You know, I mean, when you, when you lose your faith, you lose your mind. Right. Faith and reason go together, yep. and that's yep. important. But that's the, this this ruling doesn't just go against the Bible. This ruling goes directly against reason. Nature and reason. They're saying we uh, we have created this artificial construct to to uh, uh, placate people that are you know at, at, to be the most charitable confused. That's a good charitable word. You know, and and we are going to rather uncharitably support them in their confusion and conflate that somehow with human dignity, yeah. and then legislate based on something that that doesn't even exist. You know that that is the uh, that's the thing that we're up against. Well, I is, think is, is this irrationality. I, I'm going to give me one second. I'm no, going to I'm going to run this it. down for you. Run it down, because 16th century and uh, the rise of Protestantism. We don't need the Pope to tell us what Jesus says. All we need is the Bible. Right. <clears throat> A couple hundred years later, the the culture that that created rebels against faith and says we're only going to have reason now, which is French reason Revolution. alone. Right. Yeah. The French Revolution. Egalitarianism, all sure. of that. Yeah. So we don't need a pope, and now we don't need uh, we don't need the church. Right. You know we don't we don't even need God. We have my truth. Right. And then and then you fast forward a couple hundred years, and and you've got the totalitarian. You've got the atheist, atheistic, uh, you know, communism, socialism. So we've gone from we don't need the pope to we don't need the church to we don't need God, and now we've come to the LGBT, which is saying we decide what reality is. So we've gone from we don't need the pope to we don't need the church to we don't need God to we are God. Well said. You know, and that's that is that's the that's Satanism essentially. Because go back to the the Garden of Eden. Who was it that said you can be like God and decide for yourself what's right and wrong? 
No, you right? got it. You I mean, got it came it. right from the, the from the lips of the serpent. You nailed it. And Matthew, before I talk about the LGBT uh, community, you know, in the sense of people that there's a Polish archbishop I'm going <coughs> to mention after the break that is making some comments that I was just like stunned this morning when I read it, and I went, "Wow, here's a prophet." But then I found out who formed him, and you're going to find out after the break who actually formed this archbishop to speak like this, and you won't be surprised when I tell you. But before I do that, I want to uh, continue to ask you to pray for the Amazon Senate because, you know, it's going to start on the 6th of October, and we want to pray for our leaders because here's some talk about clarity with charity. Cardinal Mueller, the former prefect for the Doctrine of the Faith, said that the ban on female deacons and priests is an infallible Catholic dogma. Now, why would he say that? And the reason he's saying that is because we've got some bishops at that Amazon Senate who are saying we have to rethink this thing regarding ordination for women to the priesthood and the diaconate. And, uh, you know, we just want to talk about it. And the uh, former doctrine of the faith says, no, no, this is, you know, he's quoting St. John Paul II back in 94, the apostolic letter. This is not... You know, Ordinatio sacerdotalis. Yes, he, uh, no Tom authority. VII, he, yeah, he dropped the he dropped the hammer. He did from the chair question. of Peter. He says that no authority whatsoever can confer priestly ordination on women, and that this judgment is to be a definitively held by the church's faithful. What part don't you understand, Archbishop? Uh, you know who is making these comments, and this is why we need to be praying for our leaders in the church. That's right, because there is such a thing as as you know intellectual freedom that you need to be oh, able yeah. to explore oh, yeah, questions, right. but not challenge. Um, you know, the words of Christ. That's not intellectual freedom. That's that's license. That's well said. When we come back, we'll talk about a Polish archbishop who compares the LGBT advancement to communist oppression. What? Yes. And you're going to find out who formed this man. You're going to love this story because it shows leadership with courage and commitment to Jesus Christ. We'll be right back with much more. Welcome, Daniel. You're on the line. What's on your mind, brother? Hi, I just wanted to share a testimony about Virgin Most Powerful Radio. I had a buddy at work who, you know, he's a lukewarm Catholic guy, and I wanted him to start listening to the Terry and Jesse show, so I kept telling him to download the app, and he kept putting me off. So one day, I grabbed his phone, and I downloaded the app Uh. for him. I went on vacation, and you know, I kept telling him to listen to it. He was kind of put me off. I came back from vacation. He comes to my cubicle and he says to me, hey, man, I've been listening to Terry and Jesse's show and it's great. And it's uh, made a big impact in his life. The guy, he's going to weekly adoration a couple times a wow. week. He goes to the mass in the morning. Mm-hmm. And, uh, he's an uh, on-fire Catholic and he promotes uh, the Terry and Jesse show on the Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Wow. Daniel, what a testimony. And I want to encourage our listeners to get those cards by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org and uh, do what Daniel's doing. Go out and spread the faith by inviting people to listen to Virgin Most Powerful. Daniel, thanks for your testimony, brother. God love you. You're welcome. Sirach 11.24 says, Do not say I am self-sufficient. What harm can come to me now? According to St. Catherine of Siena, Presumption is like vermin, burrowing at the root of the tree of our soul. If we do not uproot it with great care and humility, it will eventually destroy the soul. May God keep us from all presumption of mind and heart, and realize that we depend on Him for everything. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Welcome back to the Terry and Jesse Show. To join the conversation, call 888 526 2151. 
Now, here's Terry and Jesse. Welcome back. It's Matthew Arnold and Terry Barber. And I gave you a teaser about an archbishop comparing the LGBT advancement to communist oppression. This guy reminds me of somebody back in the 5th century, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> I quote him all the time, St. Pope Felix III, right. when he said, Not to oppose error is to approve it. Not to defend truth is to suppress it. And indeed, to neglect to confound evil men when we can do it is no less a sin than to encourage them. And I'm like, wow. Here's what the uh, Polish bishop said. He's Archbishop of uh, Krakow identified LGBT ideology as a new form of totalitarianism threatening Polish freedom in a pastoral letter released on September 28th, just last week, or this week. Mm -hmm. Currently, he says, we are living at a time in which the next great threat to our freedom has appeared, said the archbishop, and it's totalitarian in nature. So what is that threat? The source is just like the totalitarianism of the 20th century, a radical rejection of God, he continued. Yeah, there it is. So I just I will continue on, but you had something if you want to jump in on it. And he says, as a consequence of this rejection, a new vision of man is being proclaimed in which he becomes the caricature uh, the char- yeah, character of himself. himself. Yeah. I thought that was well <clears throat> written the way he yeah. said that. That's so true. As part of a gender ideology, there are attempts to obliterate the natural differences between women and men. Boy, is he talking about us in America? Wow. Moreover, through the aggressive propaganda of the LGBT ideology in the name of so-called, are you ready for this word? Tolerance. Matt, you talk about that all the time. And progress. That which is most sacred to us is mocked. He's speaking rather boldly, is he not? He is. He is. Now, he also declared to the people, the people of God among them, are being forced to spread the LGBT ideology, like the gentleman in England. Right. Now, this is, this is where we... I'm listening. That's, that's the crux of it. This is where we put our finger on it. Mm-hmm. You remember Galileo? Oh, yes. Sure. You remember, you remember the time whole ago. trial and everything? Uh, that, there's, our <laughs> historical understanding of that is a caricature. Okay. That it's... Uh, that, you know, Galileo said, oh, look, the, the earth revolves around the sun. And the evil church said, no, the sun stands still in the sky because that's what the Bible says. Okay, that was not, that was not what this was about at all. <laughs> but that's and, what everybody thinks it's <clears> all. Of course, well, and weirdly, the only people that made that argument at the time were the Protestants. Um, you know, just uh, talking about historical accuracy. Sure. Why did Galileo wind up in trouble? Because he broke the law. And what law did he break, Terry? He broke the law that says you cannot teach an unproven scientific theory as though it were a fact. You think? It's against the law. Of course. He wound up confined. He didn't, he, he, by the way, he wasn't tortured by the Inquisition. He didn't get, uh, he didn't get put on the facts, rack or any of that facts. nonsense. None of that happened. Yeah, they made that up. All right, it's a bunch of polemics from the, actually communist polemics from the 1930s. And the, uh, the uh, that was communist that was revolution in Spain. Spain. Oh, well, yeah, and the, and the, the Protestants. Yeah, that's uh, what I uh, thought I read that. <clears throat> they also, you know, said, oh, you know, yeah. the evil church in Galileo, mm-hmm. uh, mischaracterizing the whole thing. Well, yeah. ultimately, um, you know, he did his best work, actually, yeah. uh, after this whole mm-hmm. controversy was over. But the point is that he taught heliocentrism as though it was a fact. And as it turns out, it's not true. The sun isn't the center of the universe. It might be the center of our solar system, but it's not the center of the universe the way Galileo thought. So first off, his science wasn't even correct. Right. Uh, But the point is that you don't take something that's not proven and run with it. Because then what happens? Oh, people start, oh, let's say passing laws and and making uh, important decisions based on something that's false. Mm -hmm. Okay. And can anybody, is is this mic on? Can anybody say global warming? Can anybody say, can anybody say uh, uh, gender ideology? Mm -hmm. These things are are not proven they're highly controversial they affect a tiny portion of the population that couldn't possibly uh, uh have the the money or influence to be making this something that's being mandated from on high all over the world what's happening here is it is a new effort at totalitarianism and this this bishop couldn't be more right you know what not many people have put the finger on it like him i mm-hmm. really mean this this is when i read this i was like Wow. Well, and that's the thing. I mean, you can you can take it out of the religious context and make the same argument. Yeah. You know, what, when when does me forcing you to deny reality and call me she when I'm a man? When did that become a matter of human dignity? 
Well said. I mean, give <laughs> you know, me a break. What, it's crazy. I, are you are you are you are you serious? You know, it'd be like me saying, Matt, you're you're a six foot ma- foot uh, man. You're a big man. I'm five foot four. Okay, I'm shrinking. But if I said to you, I'm six foot four, and get you off know, my lawn. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm now six foot four because I said it. Right. Yeah. I, Wouldn't I, you I, say I'm a little crazy? Well, and and also see how that goes against. What Bishop Sheen said in the first segment, he said, you know, people want to be good. They don't will to be good. Yeah. Well, you can't, you can't will to be six feet tall, Terry. No. You know, you have reality. to. reality. Yeah. You have to remain within the bonds of reality. And again, you see that progression. Yeah. Luther said, reason is the enemy of faith. And there was, he abandoned reason. Yeah. 200 years later, the backlash was so great. They said, people said, we don't need faith at all. Reason alone. Wow. And now here we are in our postmodern world yeah. and people are rejecting reason. Again. Yeah, but not, but not. They're not rejecting reason for a blind faith. They're no. rejecting reason for nonsense. Well, I would also say nonsense. I'm going to be more direct. Dangerous say, nonsense. Yeah, I'm going to even say for immorality. Okay, so sinful oh, well, no activity. Question. Okay, yeah. that's all. Now, the Archbishop says the freedom of conscience is broken. They are encouraging to turn away from the principles of their Christian faith. Just what you're saying. Right. But this is the Archbishop, Matt. You're not in management. You're in sales. <laughs> yeah, you know? that's right. I, <laughs> that's how yeah. I looked. Yeah. Now, he, he who hears you, or he who hears me, <laughs> just hears me. That's just it. Can you tell that we are having fun? I hope you're having fun and you're being entertained by these two knuckleheads, but also being informed and inspired to fall deeper in love with Jesus Christ. This is what this Archbishop's doing to me. He clearly says, he reminds us of the totalitarian times of communism, just what you were saying, mm-hmm. when the Polish People Republic, when the so Social advancement was a, was guaranteed only to members of the Communist Party, and right. Christians believers were treated like second class citizens. Right, and it's Not happening familiar? again, and it's happening here, which is even you know scarier. Yeah. yeah, it is. It is. The Archbishop also warned that warned that some local governments have introduced sex education programs recommended by the World Health Organization to schools and kindergartens, resulting in great spiritual harm to children and young people. Thank you, Archbishop. Again, how is it that something that is... I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to tell, tell, tell you a true story. Good. Uh, my son, Macklin, is what? 26 years oh, old yeah. now. This is when he was in the third grade. Okay. Because this is oh, a number yeah. of years ago. 20 years. 20 years ago. And um, his f- former teacher, his, his second grade teacher, came to me privately and said... I want to show you, and of course he would. He was already out of second grade. He had moved on, mm-hmm. um, and we, shortly after this, we pulled him out of school entirely and homeschooled all of our children. Uh, yeah. and this was part of the catalyst for that. Is that she showed me these materials that they were the sex ed materials, and this is twenty some odd years ago in a Catholic Much school. Much worse now in a Catholic school, yeah. <clears throat> and they were deeply objectionable yeah. to me as a parent. I thought, well, that's that's just that's you it. can't do it. And then she showed me, well, but here's. Here's the uh, the stuff they, they send home to mom and dad, and it wasn't in there. All that explicit stuff was only in the classroom. Oh my! They, they were it was they were hiding it from the parents. It's even worse. You know now, of course, it's it's become so entrenched that uh, that they're mandating it. Yeah. You know they don't they don't have to sneak it in anymore. They don't have to to you know right. hide it under a veil of respectability somehow. Now it's just uh, you know. Uh, you know, drag queen story hour at the at the local library and yep. all that stuff. It's, yep. it's it is it's like the it's like the uh, mainstream now. Yeah, well, it's like the the uh, the the nuts are in charge of the asylum. You got it. You know? So it's a uh, it, it. But that's the thing. I mean, she this is a girl that was uh, uh, discerning a vocation, a religious order, and she left. I mean, she left the the order and she left teaching. I mean, she left the school because she couldn't, in good conscience, do it. God bless her. You know, and I couldn't in good conscience allow my, I mean, I went and made a fuss and to no avail. No, no. So, but I couldn't leave the, the children there. Well said. Well, this is what the archbishop is saying is all of this is clearly offensive to God, the creator, he wrote. And that's what I think we all need to know, that this is offensive to God first. Yeah. Well, yeah, absolutely. Now, he counseled the people of the archdiocese against indifference about this anti-moral offensive that threatens individual families, societies, and his nation. Now, as the Archbishop of Krakow, guess what? He's the successor of Carol Watilia. Who was that, yeah, John? Watilia, right, yeah. That was St. John Paul II. <clears throat> yeah. Now you know why he's so strong. Mm-hmm. He was formed so well. And he is linking all of this uh, to fight this through Eucharistic adoration. I'm not going to read more because we got, we're running out of time, and I want right, to get right, to right. the Eucharist. But he's asking 
all of the dioceses to fight against this by instituting Eucharistic adoration, not in one parish, all the parishes. Before Mass, they're praying the rosary and having Eucharistic adoration as a way to fight back. He said, this is not only a duty to the noble achievements of our ancestors. See how he brings it back? Just mm-hmm. like I do to my, mm-hmm. my kids. Hey, the dignity of the barber name, the yeah. Arnold name. You know, in other words, being a cat, we, we go back to our ancestors, the saints, and generations of Poles who have lived the faith in times of persecution. He said, this is especially the responsibility of parents who, above all, should care about the happiness and prosperity of their children. Now, he concluded this letter by announcing this, Jess, or Matthew, that since November, coming up now, November next month, until the end of 2020, this is what he's doing, silent adoration in all the churches and public chapels in the archdiocese for a half hour before evening mass, followed by a decade of the rosary and prayers asking for the intercession of guess who? St. John and Paul II. Second. Yeah, there you go. Second. Now, there's definitely, he said, a cultural war in Poland right now. And in recent months, the archbishop has become a major symbol in that war. And I just want to say, let's be inspired by this archbishop who's standing up for the truth. He said, the Polish society is extremely polarized right now. Yet, as you know, the Polish papers are trying to go after us. We have to stand strong. He <clears> said that that it's in the grip of a religious Cold War. Mm -hmm. So he's asking people to stand up. Here's the difference, I think. This archbishop who's standing up for the truth about the dignity of the human person and and is that he's asking the lay people to take action items of prayer and reparation and to stand up for what Jesus Christ has taught for 20 centuries regarding the dignity of man and women. You know, not only... Is that a, a Catholic response? It's an important response in this way. That is maybe something that's underemphasized. Why is it? Eucharistic adoration, yeah. prayer of the rosary, right? Doing those things. Not only is that a, a great witness to the world that we say, "Hey, man, we we believe that these spiritual things are more powerful yeah. than government coercion or whatever," because we've, you know, we've outlasted every evil empire that ever existed. You know. Yep. It's like, how, how, how are the Romans doing these days? How, how are the Vandals? How, yep. how, how's that going, right? Well said. The Catholic Church is still around. But it's also important on an individual level yeah. that when you or I spend time in front of the Blessed Sacrament oh. in prayer, when we spend time meditating on the mysteries of the Rosary, asking the intercession of our Blessed Mother, we grow stronger, each and every one of us. You nailed it. You nailed it. And what Pope Pius X said, while Jesus was kind to sinners, he did not respect their false ideas. Amen. He loved them all, but also instructed them in order to convert them and to save them. That's what this archbishop is doing. When we come back, we want to inspire you on your love for the Eucharist. We talk about Eucharistic adoration. Wait, when we come back, we got two segments of deep teachings on the real presence. We'll be right back. We have an exciting story for you to listen to, the story of John Pridmore. John Pridmore was a hitman for the gangs in East London. I met some guys who seemed to have everything that I thought would make you happy. So I started working for these people, so to my shame I was involved in vicious crime of all sorts. He collected debts for the gangs, and if people didn't pay their debts, it was his job to kill them. And as I drove home that night, I thought, what have I become that I could kill someone and not even care? He was in the elevator on his way up to the 17th floor, and there was a 17-year-old young man in the elevator with him. Suddenly, this young man looked John right in the eye, and he said, Jesus loves you. And I said the first prayer I'd ever said. I said, up to now, all I've done is take from you, God. Now I want to give. Within a year, by the grace of God, John was able to get out of the gang and be freed from this road to hell that he had been walking on. Go to Virgin Most Powerful YouTube channel and listen to this story today.
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Welcome back to the Terry and Jesse Show. To join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Now, here's Terry and Jesse. <laughs> All right, welcome back to the Terry and Jesse Show. Matthew Arnold sitting in for Jess Romero this week. Great to be along with you here on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. We're talking about the Holy Eucharist. And why are we doing this, Matthew? Because everybody's been talking about this Pew Research Back on August 6th, right, finding right. out that not many Catholics believe in the real presence. And what I was shocked about this, Matt, is for 40 years, I go to churches, and after Mass in the parking lot, I would ask Catholics what they believed about the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. And all those years never changed. It was just they didn't understand the Mass or the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Now, I'm going to take this material from my Opus Angelorum newsletter, because when you think about this, uh, given these numbers that they show that people don't believe, is it no wonder that the church has been in a crisis for the last 60 years? It's high time to mobilize our missionary spirit. Yes, it's high time. I agree, Father. As we mentioned this, Pope Benedict XVI attributes the priest scandals to what? A lack of faith within the church. Well, he nailed it. To put the matter succinctly, the laity does not believe because priests have not preached the faith. Amen. Wow, Jesse. I mean, Matthew, we're really laying it out. And they have scandalized the faithful. Priests have not preached the faith either because they did not receive it with zeal in the seminary, which is very true, or yeah. because of a great, I'm just calling it, a moral sellout. A living and sharing the faith did not motivate their lives. Therefore, behind the crisis of faith in the Eucharist among the laity, Guess what, Matt? A greater crisis is a betrayal within the ranks of the hierarchy. I know that's hard to have to say, Matt, because mm -hmm. I can't judge the hierarchy, but I can judge their actions. <clears throat> and unfortunately, yeah. Matt, this situation is not new, as you know, in the history of salvation. Right. Such infidelity has plagued the people of God from the early days of the Old Testament. That's right. That's right. Well, yeah, I mean, you, you see the, uh, the, the history of Israel. Mm -hmm. as, exactly. As just this, you know, this ongoing story of their... their Falling away and coming back and falling away and That's coming in corrupt hierarchy and corrupt kings, you know, gee, corrupt, corrupt uh, prelates and corrupt politicians. Yeah, it's happening. Man, you knock me over with a feather. How, how did that ever happen? You know? <laughs> You're funny. But obviously, it's all throughout salvation history. It is, and that's the point here. And Benedict proposes that we ourselves must once again begin to live by God and unto Him above all. We ourselves must learn again to recognize God as the foundation of our life. Really, Matthew, this is a, a, a crisis of leaving God out of our life. When, um, and I'm not going to name names. I don't want to scandalize anybody. But I can recall uh, some years ago, many years ago, that my wife went to a, a dinner. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I was not there. I don't know if I was traveling or whatever. But, mm -hmm. but she went to the dinner and was seated with a priest and a bishop. Wow. And she has the habit, whenever she meets a priest and they're just having a <laughs> conversation, she'll ask you know, it's just like when you meet a convert. Oh, sure. what, what had you brought in? Of course. How did you feel a call to the priesthood? Yeah. How did you know that God was calling you? And the bishop said, oh, well, I, I could have been, you know, I could have been anything. I could have been a doctor or a lawyer. I mean, this is this is what I chose to do. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. I mean, Wrong. And, and well, of course, you know, if somebody that, that becomes a priest because he, he looks at it as a job option, you know, uh, and then and then rises to, to this high level, clearly there was something in his formation that's going to keep him from being able to be the kind of witness that he needs to be. And, oh, what, you what, it. and what they said right there, they put it without God as the center. Well, that's just the key. And, you know, while the renewal of the church calls for leadership, it cannot succeed unless the laity, that's us, Matt, yeah. rises to the call and takes up this, I love this word, crusade. Mm, there you go. I like that term. Me too. A banner for the good of mankind <laughs> in the church. Now, there's a priest out in New Zealand. I don't know him, Father Roger Landry. But he articulated this truth well, declaring, while in history reforms have been championed by popes, bishops, 
and founders of religious order and their spiritual sons and daughters. The real reform of the church, are you ready, Matt? This is what Bishop Sheen said, too. Happens when the lay people assimilate it and live it. The church is not made of marble, wood, bricks, and glass, but of men, women, boys, and girls who build their lives, here it comes, firmly on Christ, the cornerstone, and Peter, the rock of whom Jesus constructed the church. Wow. Now that's, now that's setting it up for this. Here's my, here's my point. Through Eucharistic adoration, and this is what the Archbishop of Poland was talking about, mm-hmm. we've got to bring this back because this is going to articulate the real presence of Christ. If people understood that Jesus is waiting for us in his sacrament of love, they hopefully will get the message. Now, Matt, I give people homework often on the Terry and Jesse <laughs> show, and I ask people to open up their catechism. I see you got your catechism open up, mm-hmm. but I want to recommend this, and then I'll turn it to you. I'm just gonna. I've got four, five, four different paragraphs of the catechism that summarize really well what we believe. Number one, thirteen twenty-four paragraph. Open up your book, your your catechism, and read this this weekend. It says the Eucharist is the source and summit of the Christian life. The other sacraments and indeed all ecclesiastical ministries and works of the apostolate, are you ready, folks, are bound up with the Eucharist and are are orientated towards it. For the blessed Eucharist, it contains the whole spiritual good of the church, namely Christ himself. Now, Matthew, reading that and saying, well, if we don't believe in that, now I get why we're we're anemic right now in the church. That's a strong Mm -hmm. word, but anemic meaning we're not living out this faith. We act like Jesus isn't there in the church. Yeah, well, and part of it, you know, like I said, uh, uh, one of the important things about a life of prayer, yeah, and, and especially prayer in mm-hmm. front of the Blessed Sacrament, is that it strengthens your faith. Of course it, it That does. it makes your, and with your faith is strong. Because how much, how much skin do you have to have in the game to say, oh, well, the Eucharist, yeah, it's just a symbol, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, how easy is it to do that? How lazy is it to do that? Yeah. You remember in, in John chapter 6 how, how everyone left our Lord. And then um, what did the apostles say? And even the apostles, yeah, I mean, yeah, Jesus turns to them and says, will you, you also you leave? Too? And what did they say? Well, and Peter says, you, you know, words, you have the words of eternal life. Exactly. And, and that's it. Peter didn't understand. Yeah. He didn't get, he didn't know that he was talking about the real presence yeah. in the Eucharist. I mean, he, they, they couldn't know that yet. But he's saying, look, I'm, I'm God. I say it. And so it's true. Therefore, you need to believe it, whether you understand it or not. Yeah. And of course, transubstantiation, we, we've done a great deal over the centuries to to define that, yeah. what it is we yeah. believe. But do you understand it? Yeah. No, do you understand how Christ is? No, of course yeah. not. No, of course not. It's a do you understand how the substance of something can change while the accidents remain the same? You know, you know who was fascinated by that? Yes, Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein, that's right. <laughs> Got together with Bishop Sheen going, it's like, tell me about this, man. Because <laughs> I think he was just so fascinated he by was. the idea of, of you know, the substance of something being able to change that way. But this is not, even before we articulated the, the doctrine of transubstantiation, just in the martyr, we are taught, right? In other words, I've received... How far back is that, man? Uh, he died in 166. That's pretty far back. Okay, so early, early okay. second century. He's saying we are taught, so mm-hmm. it's a tradition of the church already, yep. <clears throat> that this consecrated food is the flesh and blood of the incarnate Son. Wow. Um, St. Cyril of Jerusalem. What seems bread is not bread, though it tastes so, but is the body of Christ. What seems wine is not wine, though it seemed to the taste, but is the blood of Christ. St. Augustine said it, I think, most beautifully... Christ was holding himself in his own hands oh my God. as he held out his sacred body and said, this is my body. That is so beautiful. It really you know, is. And there it is. And it, but it's, it's also so simple. It's so clear. There it is. And you know, Matt, before I get to other paragraphs, I just want to encourage you. We're in that novena right now of Eucharistic adoration at the chapel for nine days, praying for the Amazon Senate for our leaders in the church. And the folks that come for our holy hour, we pray the rosary. I do the Stations of the Cross. We have to quiet time, and we're reflecting and praying for our church. And I think that's, I, I'm going to be honest with you, that work that I do going to church for one hour for this novena, I think it's one of the most important things I do uh, for the church. And, and being on the radio an hour a day or two hours on Tuesday mm-hmm. is nothing compared to being before the Blessed Sacrament. That's just the facts. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. What, I'm uh, doing more for the church there. Sure. Because you're, you're in the presence of God himself. You got it, partner. Matthew, this is another quote from the Catechism 1325. He says, the Catechism says, The Eucharist is the efficacious sign 
and sublime cause that communion in the divine life and the unity of the people of God by which the church is kept being. It is the highlight of both of God's action, sanctifying the world in Christ, and of the worship men offer to Christ through him, to the Father and the Holy Spirit. Now, let me just throw something at you, and I'm, I'm Okay, I'm going, to throw, I'm going to throw something back at you. Yeah, I'm speculating. <laughs> okay. You think that because of the lack of people understanding the Eucharist, that that might affect people worshiping God? Yeah, maybe. Just a guess. Yeah, maybe, just a guess. Well, sure. Well, look at the, look at the, look at the, the Reformers and, and, and what happened to them. There you go. I mean, those... Luther... Um, really had to get rid of the priesthood, so he, he attacked the sacraments. Of course. Right. Yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. Only, the only sacraments he accepted were baptism and, and holy matrimony right. because they're the, the two sacraments that you don't, you know, that, are, that are, don't absolutely positively require a priest. Right. So um, it, it was the priesthood, and of course, it was really an attack on the, on the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Now, he had his own idea, consubstantiation, this right. idea that With. Christ is sort of there if you believe he's there, and it makes you the master of, you know, Jesus comes if I want him to. Yeah. You know, it's not and, how it and, works, and, folks. And that's not how it works. And you can see how it made a shipwreck of faith and how we can wind up with 40-some thousand different Protestant denominations today. And Matt, when we come back from the break, I want to ask you something about being a convert to the Catholic faith and the teachings of the real presence and how that came to you. Because I think that it's fascinating. I'm a cradle Catholic. I've always believed in the real presence. Never had a doubt. I mean, I thought everybody, you know, loved Jesus in the Eucharist because it was so clear but obviously, it's not that clear to some. So when we come back from the break, I'd like to ask what you have to say about how you fell in love with Jesus and the Eucharist as a convert. I want to also re- re- tell our listeners a, a big thank you. We just finished our month of October. We got 20. I mean, it'll be honestly, September. September. Thank you. <laughs> month of September. I'm jumping ahead with 20 new monthly donors. It's the Amen. most we've ever had. I got a new person yesterday who called me and said, I want to you know, donate $35 a month. I told him, thank you so much. Here's what you're going to get. And you're going to get recordings from conferences right now. I just sent out the one with Father Don Calloway, Jesse Romero, and myself on Divine Mercy. Had, we had 800 people at the conference. People love the talks. And you're going to get that. And that's the kind of thing you're getting each month. If you're mm-hmm. a monthly donor, if you want to become a monthly donor, I give my cell phone number out. Yeah, 661-972-7872. Or you can do it online to virginmostpowerfulradio.org. Mm-hmm. Or call the office at 877-526-2151. Lots of ways to give. Boy, we'll, uh, and we'll take any of them. Happy to have you along with us. Because without you, uh, without your support, both financial and especially spiritual, we couldn't do what we do, which we're going to do a lot more of when we come back. You know, Hi, this is Terry Barber. I want to share with you a wonderful program called The Legacy of Love and Devotion. Well, what is it? Well, it's where you share your life and love of your Catholic faith with your family for the next century and beyond. Let's face it. Our Lord is going to call you home at some time. And how are you going to evangelize your relatives in the future? Well, by coming into my studio by a telephone call and telling your story of how you love Jesus and Mary and the church and giving information to your great-grandchildren and beyond their love for the Catholic faith. How does it work? I'm going to tell you more if you call me on my cell phone, 661-972-7872, and I'll give you all the details of how you can pass on your Catholic faith to the next generation and the following generations. It's a very unique program. I want to tell you more about it. Call me at 661-972-7872. God love you. This is Terry Barber. I want to invite you to take advantage of having your funeral or your loved one's funeral at the Sacred Heart Chapel in downtown Covina. It's a 115-year-old church, beautiful chapel, and all you got to do is call me at 661-972-7872, and I'll personally make the arrangements with your mortuary to have your funeral or your loved one's funeral here at Sacred Heart Chapel. You won't regret it. 661-972-7872. God love you.
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Welcome back to the Terry and Jesse Show. To join the conversation, call 888-526-2151. Now, here's Terry and Jesse. <laughs> wow, we're back again. Our last segment, boy, does it go by. Matthew, we're talking about the Holy Eucharist, the source and summit of the Christian life. And I asked <clears> you a <throat> question about being a convert uh, to Catholicism. So, I mean, even as a non-Catholic, I bet you didn't spend much time about thinking about, you know, Jesus present in the Holy Eucharist. No, it wasn't even so. on the radar. It was, I I, it was a concept that I was introduced to you know, really by my wife and then, you know, yeah. formally in at RCIA. Yeah, Father. Uh, yeah, but it was not. Uh, and and I, I can tell you one thing, Terry, tell that um, uh, when Betty was trying to explain to me, you know, yeah. you know, because I would go to mass with her and stuff sure. while we were dating and sure. when we were first married and whatnot. And she, you know, has a great devotion Love to Christ and the Eucharist <laughs> and all that. And, uh, and she's explaining this doctrine to me, and I'm going, it's like, you know, it, it's difficult for me to accept that the people in this room really believe that. Of course, by their actions. That's yeah. what you're referring to, right? Absolutely. Yeah. You got people, you know, chewing gum all the way up until it's time for communion. Uh, you got or, a good you know, point there. Sitting there and reading a, reading a bulletin while the, during the homily. It's yeah. like, you know. Why, why aren't they? How, how into this like, are you really, you yeah, know? It's yeah, like, makes sense. <clears throat> so, so then how did you come to, even through scandal, and I call that scandal, but uh -huh. maybe cradle Catholics don't show reverence for the Blessed Sacrament. Uh, you know, to non-Catholics and people who just come to visit, say, how you know, how could this be true if you guys aren't acting like it? How did you overcome that? Well, you know, for me, again, it's uh, getting the gift of faith, realizing that yeah. there is a, a personal oh, yeah. God, and that personal God actually cares about me yeah, that's and my salvation. That's, you know, that's a life-changing thing. And so every, you know, uh, man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. And yeah. that was very much, uh, very much me, the very idea and again, you know, uh, the only kind of Christianity I had ever had any real contact with was the kind of evangelical fundamentalist yeah. type uh, and a little mainstream Protestantism, and they don't believe in the real presence at all. Right. And, and uh, you know, have this whole thing, oh, it's about this relationship with Jesus. It's like, well, how much more personal, Yeah, that's a scum, how much more intimate a relationship yeah. could you possibly get yep. than to actually receive him physically? Yeah. You know, not just spiritually, but physically, that he's sacramentally present. Whatever, Powerful. I mean, and that's and it's mysterious, but but it's uh, you well, know, but it's true. I think of that. And I'll just tell you, as a cradle Catholic, I fell in love with Jesus Christ and the Eucharist when I was 14 years old, and started going to daily mass, thinking that I'm present at that one eternal sacrifice. It was Bishop Sheen who really got me excited about the Holy Mass and about the Blessed Sacrament and Holy Hours and. I was like, wow, this just makes so much sense. And then to realize that when I'm in, in front of Jesus Christ, that it's almost like, you know, people say that, you know, they get sunburned from the sun. But I'm, I'm, in, I'm in the rays of, of the presence of Christ. And if I'm going to serve Christ, it makes sense that I spend time with him thinking and praying with his word of God and being in the presence of Christ. So now for many, many years, I mean, decades I made a commitment to make the daily holy hour uh, at five o'clock in the morning. I'm in church. Why? Praying before the 620 mass and asking God to bless me in my day and thank God for the day and ask him to give me the graces to share the gospel with people. And I really believe that that's my most precious time of my day is, and I'm so clear thinking in the morning. So that's just me. Now other people can say, Hey, I make my holy hour, my visit in the evening because that's when my I'm a, I'm a right. night out. Yeah, right. And that's okay. I'm in a fog when I get up in the morning. Right, right. Yeah. You're in the fog. But here's the point. The Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches so clearly, paragraph 1326, that finally, by the Eucharistic celebration, we're talking about Mass, we already unite ourselves with the heavenly liturgy and anticipate eternal life with God will be all in all. That's such a short sentence. Mm -hmm. Think about that. That... We have a taste of heaven when we're at Mass. 
how many Catholics really can understand or even not understand, even realize how many Catholics know that when they're at Mass, it's a foretaste of heaven? Well, and Terry, you, you put your finger on it. Just like think about all the gifts. I mean, every, virtually everything in our life, uh, with the exception of our sin, yeah. is a gift from God. We, Absolutely. You know, we, we can lay claim nothing, even our, our talents and our abilities, right. all of that comes from God. Yeah. <clears throat> and of all the gifts that he gave us, the gift of the Holy Spirit, yeah. the gift of uh, his, his, our Blessed Mother, mm-hmm. it's that sacrifice, yeah. right? Adam lost heaven for us all because he represented the entire human race. Yeah. And now God becomes a man in order to undo that, to, to, to offer the one sacrifice. And then he, at, at the Last Supper, he, he institutes this sacrament so that you're right, when you're at Mass, you're present at that very self same sacrifice on the cross. I know. Smoke that. I know that sounds terrible to say that, <laughs> but I'm mean, think about that. Every time you're at mass, this Sunday when you're at mass, Matt, tell them what they're going to be thinking about one more time. Yeah, that, that you are in fact at the foot of the cross. Wow. That you're at the foot of the That's cross exciting. with John and the Blessed Virgin oh. and the Magdalene. Love it. You know, and surrounded by a host of angels. And that's that's all, you know, you, you don't see that with your physical eyes, but that's why he gave us the sacrament as a physical, tangible reality that, that re- represents to us the, the greater spiritual reality that's actually true. And if you're place. having a difficulty understanding that, are you asking Jesus fi- Christ for more faith every day? Faith is a gift that comes from God's pure goodness. Therefore, it is a gift for which we must always pray. Amen, brother. Well said. Thank you. Well said. Wow. <coughs> We're almost at the end, but I want to read this last segment, a last paragraph from the Catechism. It mm-hmm. says, 1327, in brief, the Eucharist is the sum and summary of our faith. Our way of thinking is attuned to the Eucharist, and the Eucharist, in turn, confirms our way of thinking. Matt, if that's true and you wonder why we've got a crisis in our church right now, the church is saying that it's the summary of our faith. But if we don't believe, how can we live the faith? That's right. Think of this. Think of the words that he said. And by, by the way, that, that, uh, that line, our way of thinking is attuned to the Eucharist, and the Eucharist in turn yeah, confirms right. our way of thinking. That's St. Irenaeus. Yeah, that's right. That said that in, in, right. In, uh, against the heresies in his great encyclical. Or uh, his great uh, um, yeah. document letter, right here, it says in the Catechism, and he is is telling us that our way of thinking mm-hmm. is attuned to the Eucharist, and the Eucharist therefore uh, confirms our way of thinking. Isn't that beautifully stated? Bad thinking is at the root of our problems. You nailed it. Okay, the the LGBTQ, the the socialism, the, the, all of the all of the stuff you that we're dealing it. with in our society, the, the stuff in the church, yeah. the people trying to to, to put a question mark. Where, where the church has put a period. Yes. All of those things stem directly from bad thinking. And that's why you, if your thinking is attuned to the Eucharist and then the Eucharist confirms your thinking, you're not going to be susceptible to that. You're not going to fall you know, for, for what's literally the oldest trick in the book if your mind is conformed to Christ. Isn't that what St. Paul tells us? And what is the greatest thinking prayer, Terry? The greatest prayer that we have is the Mass, Our, the, yep. and, and, and we have the, the other great liturgical uh, prayer, which is the Divine Office or Liturgy of the Hours. But, but after those liturgical prayers, after the official prayer of the Church, the most commended, the most encouraged, the one thing that, that Catholics uh, you know, are, are taught by a string of popes as long as your arm mm-hmm. to be the greatest prayer that you can engage in, um, especially... Um, to do it in common with other Catholics is the Holy Rosary. And the Rosary is about meditating on the gospel. It's a thinking prayer. Well said. I want to just mention one more thing from John 6. You talked about it earlier, that he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. By faith, we know that at the consecration, folks, the bread and wine cease to exist. They are transformed into the very body and blood of Jesus, who remains hidden under the... uh, Outward appearances of bread and wine. It is Jesus who becomes really present in the sacred host, and he gives himself to all who approach him. He is not only present among us, but he wants to unite himself intimately with each of us in holy communion. Now, Matt, the efficacy of the sacrifice is fully realized when our Lord's body and blood are received in communion. The Eucharistic sacrifice is intrinsically directed to the inward union of the faithful with Christ through communion. We receive 
the very one who offered himself for us. We receive his body, which he gave up for us on the cross, his blood, which he poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I, I get excited about that because, let me just throw this at you. We hear songs that say Jesus is in the bread and wine. That's oh, false. Yeah. See, yeah. we need to go back to the fundamentals of what our church teaches and fall deeper in love with Jesus in the Eucharist. That's my take. Amen. You've been reading from the, the catechism, and uh, I, you know, I don't like to be polemical, but <laughs> I, I, I would suggest to you yeah. that uh, you know, for, for the rank and file, especially if, if some of these things are new to you, if you yeah. didn't have a very good formation, or if you're, if you're a new Catholic, and, and maybe they haven't gone over these things, look at Baltimore Catechism, yep. the Roman Catechism. You know, these things are, are it, these, it's the same truths. Yep. They're not teaching anything different, but some, oftentimes I think. Simplified, that, though. You know, yeah, it, it's laid out in a way that's maybe a little more accessible. Mm-hmm. It's a little more, uh, uh, well, it, it's well-ordered, but I, I like the question-answer format. I've always loved that. And, and, I, and I, love the, I love the articles and the way they're written in the Roman Catechism also, which is like the, it's like the new catechism of, you know, from the 90s. It's as it's big as a telephone book, you know, yeah. <laughs> and, and it's a reference work. Yeah, and and maybe you know maybe a reference work, maybe a whole encyclopedia isn't where you want to start. Maybe you want to start with these with these questions. That's what the word catechesis. The word catechesis means echo, mm. and and that's and that's what it is. That you you know that they put the question to you, and then you come up with the answer. And then when you think about it in those terms, then when people question your faith, you know you have answers at your fingertips, not just concepts. That you know that if you listen to my show, I you know I always I was killing a flea with a sledgehammer, you know, going back to to the beginning of time to to make my point. But uh, but when you have it in that succinct question answer format, that's really a great way to apprehend your faith and a great way to pass it on. Well said, and I think that's one of the reasons, Matt. Since 1965, Doctor Hahn puts this in one of his books. Uh, since 1965 to 1990, a quarter of a billion Catholics left the church, and many of them left because they never were taught. And that's why today in a crisis right now, make a commitment for this time right now to read your Bible, read your your catechism, uh, pray your rosary. We call it the five stones <laughs> that, that, you know, five stones, five things that we can do every day that will help us fall deeper in love with Jesus Christ. Pray our rosary, go to confession at least once a month. You do all these five stones that we're talking about, and you'll weather the storm, even in times of confusion right now. Because you know why? Because you're going to have a deep relationship with Jesus Christ through his church and the sacraments. Amen. And, you know, I would, I would hasten to point out that all of those uh, points were made by St. John Paul II at yeah. the beginning of the millennium. third millennium yeah, as the program, the yeah. program. Not a new program, no, no. but the only one that's proven effective uh, over two thousand years, uh, Matt Catholicism. I'm going to ask you what state you're, uh, which state we should be living in. But also, you, your show is up next. What are you going to be talking on? Oh yeah, we're going to be talking about. Uh, well, Jimmy Aiken is going to join us okay. in the second half of the show, talking about his new book, "The Bible Is a Catholic Book," and that's going to be uh, that's kind of the special treat. We're also going to be talking about why stay Catholic, Good. and also the readings for the upcoming Sunday in the extraordinary form. So don't miss it. Coming right up after the Terry and Jesse. And show. Jesse, what uh, Matt? What state should we be living in, brother? That would be the state of grace, Terry. And what state shouldn't we be living in? We should avoid, like the plague, the state of sin. Well said. You've been listening to Virgin Most Powerful, the Terry and Jesse Show. Up next, Matt Arnold with his guest, Jimmy Aiken. May God richly bless you and your family and full sheen ahead here at Virgin Most Powerful. All right. St. Faustina's Prayer for Priests. Oh, my Jesus, I beg thee on behalf of the whole church, grant it love and the light of thy spirit, and give power to the words of priests, so that hardened hearts might be brought to repentance and return to Thee, O Lord. Lord, give us holy priests. Thou Thyself maintain them in holiness. O Divine and Great High Priest, may the power of Thy mercy accompany them everywhere and protect them from the devil's traps and snares, which are continually being set for the souls of priests. May the power of thy mercy, O Lord, shatter and bring to naught all that might tarnish the sanctity of priests. For thou canst do all things. Amen. Virgin Most Powerful, pray for us.